Heather Clark. I'm a dance teacher and historian living in Brisbane. This is the story of step dance in Australia. British settlement began in Australia relatively recently, only about 230 years ago, and consequently we have a well-documented history. On the surface this does not extend to the art of dancing, but there are many records which inadvertently give an insight into what was once an important pastime. To begin, let's travel back a little further to the days when the ancient Greek philosophers debated that there must be a continent in the southern hemisphere to balance the land mass in the north. And because this would be on the underside of the world, so to speak, the people there must look quite different. And this supposed country became known as the Antipodes. If you think about this for a moment, you'll realise it means anti, opposite and podes feet. In medieval times, there are some intriguing illustrations of what this was supposed to look like, some depicting the inhabitants as having their feet back to front, and in one case, just one foot held high in the air while the body was upside down. Now, I assure you, just in case you're wondering, this isn't in fact true, and since we're discussing step dancing today, I thought it was a point worth clarifying. When Captain James Cook set out from England in 1768, he wasn't sure what he'd find, but he found no one with back-to-front feet and instead found Australia. Cook himself was remarkable because he encouraged his crew to dance hornpipes and country dances, in the belief not only that it kept them fit and healthy, but also kept them happy. It was common practice for sailors to dance, and it had long been a regular part of shipboard life. Cook was exceptional because he recognised the benefits of dancing and actively supported it in his regime for looking after the crew. He also used dancing as part of the cultural exchange as he travelled the South Seas. And although most accounts focus on the dancers of the indigenous people, there are also descriptions of his men dancing hornpipes to entertain the locals and accounts of the local people imitating them, often with great hilarity. In 1788, the first consignment of convicts arrived in Australia to establish a penal colony. Within days of them arriving in Botany Bay, there's an account of the seamen going ashore and dancing to the music of a fife, to the delight of the locals. Shortly after this, the first accounts of the convicts dancing with the Aboriginal people begin to be described. Although it's impossible to know exactly what dances they shared, it seems highly likely that step dancers would have been part of these exchanges. I've been studying the history of dance in Australia for about 30 years. In 2018, I completed a doctoral research project focusing on convict dancing in the early colony. This entailed discovering what the lower orders were dancing in the British Isles in the period between 1788 and 1840. The term lower orders was used at the time to describe what we now call the working classes or the common people. The majority of the convicts came from this group. The evidence suggests that step dancing was a significant part of their popular culture. There are no images of convicts dancing, but there are many illustrations which depict the lower orders dancing, and they often look like this, showing a couple dancing together. The transcripts from the Central Criminal Court in London, the well-known Old Bailey, provide a fabulous resource for finding information about common people. It is noted as one of the most extensive resources for this type of information. There is a surprising amount of detail about dancing. Much of it relates to social dancing, but there's also details about step dancing, including accounts of people dancing on the shutters of cellars a favourite spot for step dancers. Once people were convicted and imprisoned, it didn't stop them from dancing. This plan of Newgate Prison shows three tap rooms where people could gather to drink, sing and dance. And there is a body of evidence to prove that they did just so. Charles Dickens wrote a story called The Warden's Room where he describes one of the inmates dancing a hornpipe. Dickens himself had first-hand experience of prison life. As a child, he had visited his father in the Marshalsea Debtors' Prison. 
It is rare to find illustrations of prisoners dancing, though there are several reports to confirm that dancing was a common activity. Dancing was such an integral part of life that the term was used metaphorically to describe other things. For those who fell seriously foul of the law, their death throes at the end of a hangman's noose were known as the gallows jig or the Paddington Frisk, or in Ireland, the Kilmainham Minuet. For those unfortunate enough to be one of many on a hanging day, they were said to be dancing at the sheriff's ball. For those convicts who avoided the gallows, there was transportation to the colonies. Even prisoners awaiting transportation still found opportunities to dance. There are accounts of them dancing on the hulks used to house those awaiting departure from Britain. One of the assigned surgeons who cared for convicts, Peter Cunningham, remarked on the nonchalance of some of the prisoners who turned the jingling of their chains into music to accompany their singing and dancing as they were moved from the hulks and loaded onto the ship. The precedent for this notion of dancing in fetters, dating from the late 1600s, when dancing in chains became an act in the theatre. It gained popularity when it was used in the Beggar's Opera and was well known into the 1800s. This illustration uses the image of the popular dancing fetters in a political satire. Once on board the ship, some of the surgeons responsible for the convict's well-being actively promoted dancing as a daily activity, and this is recorded in their journals. Given the limited space on board, it seems likely that step dancing was one of the most prevalent types of dance. When convicts arrived in Australia, their dancing was noted in police reports published in the newspapers. Not that dancing was illegal, but the times and circumstances surrounding it often led to it being mentioned. It was usually associated with drinking, creating a public nuisance, being out after curfew, or dancing in a disorderly house. Individuals were commonly noted dancing hornpipes, jigs, flings and reels. In this extract from the Sydney Monitor of 1838, John Peppermill was charged with dancing a hornpipe in George Street, one of the main streets of Sydney, against the peace of our sovereign lady, and received the unusually harsh penalty of 50 lashes. The punishments were more often a charge of five shillings paid to the poor or an hour in the stocks. Even after the main convict era ended in 1840, traces of their dancing remained. In 1915, the Brisbane Truth recalled, Some of the dames who on occasion needed some kindly police attention were relics of the convict system. These poor souls were usually quiet in their conduct, and subdued in their manner, but on festive occasions they were apt to demonstrate their ability to step dance in cutty sarks or other deshabille, which at their time of life could scarcely be accepted as fascinating undress. One well-known character of this class was an old woman named Hannah Rigby, who used to live alone in a hut near Queen Street. She died at 77 years of age in 1853 of apoplexy, induced by her terpsichorean liveliness and general conviviality at a wedding in the house next door to her humble establishment. Over time, transportation ended and there were fewer convicts and more free settlers. The links to Britain were very strong and our culture followed what was happening there despite life being very different. The gender balance was still considerably more male, particularly in rural areas, and step dancing was very popular amongst the men who worked as shearers, stockmen, boundary riders and bullock drivers. There are many tales of these men gathering in pubs or in campsites to drink, dance and tell yarns. One story tells of a shearer who would shear one sheep, take a break and dance a few steps, then start on the next sheep, and so on throughout the day. Another fellow danced on fence posts to drive them into the ground, and in a droving camp, the cook entertained by dancing a hornpipe on top of a box as 1,200 sheep and 400 cattle looked on in astonishment. 
There was often a competitive edge, and it was common for doors to be taken off their hinges and laid flat on the ground to provide the appropriate platform. The author Banjo Patterson described such an event at a country race meeting in 1906. The competitors, described as young bloods, wore their best finery. Cabbage tree hat, well tilted back and secured by a string under the nose, gaudy cotton shirt and tweed trousers of loud pattern, secured around the waist by flaring red or green sashes. They began by ambling with a sort of strutting walk once or twice around the circumscribed platform, then, with head well back and eyes closed, dashed into the steps of the dance, each introducing varied steps and innovations of his own. Throughout the 19th century, the dancers were usually described as hornpipes, jigs, step dances or breakdowns, as well as highland flings and Irish jigs. In 1832, there's the first record of a clog dance, where in the theatre, a clog hornpipe was danced on a rope. After this date, accounts of clog dancing become increasingly common, mirroring its popularity in England. The National Library of Australia has an extensive resource of digitised newspapers. A recent search revealed over 20,000 references to clog dancing in Australia. There are reports of all manner of clog dancers, Lancashire dancers, hornpipes, the Liverpool double, country clog dance, and from the 1880s, the clog waltz begins to be mentioned. There are many reports of competitions. In Melbourne in 1869, there was a great intercolonial clog dancing competition which attracted 18,000 spectators. For all its popularity, there are very few tangible records of this tradition. So it was significant in 2016 when the Family History Programme, Who Do You Think You Are?, examined the forebears of the celebrity Craig Revel Horwood. It was discovered that Craig's great-great-grandfather, Harry Macklinshaw, had been the champion clog dancer of Australia in 1871 and that his family still had his championship medal. This is the only known artefact to remain of the clog dancing tradition in Australia. The BBC contacted me and asked me if I would talk to Craig on the show and teach him a few clog steps. I was able to find a step dance tune, a hornpipe, which had been collected in the area where his great-great-grandfather had lived and danced, and this was the one we used in the show. It was a wonderful opportunity to be involved. Craig has since become the patron of the InStep research team. He also created a modern production called 14 Days for the Ballet Boys, featuring a clog dancing scene based on his family history. Clog dancing competitions weren't solely for men, and one noteworthy female dancer was Bella Perman. Bella was the clog dancing champion of Australia, and she performed on the stage with her two brothers. In 1898, Bella was in London, and challenged the reigning world champion, Minnie Ray, to a clog dancing contest. There are a number of newspaper accounts, and it seems Bella danced 12 steps over eight minutes, including a twizzle, but Minnie kept the title. Caroline Radcliffe has written a chapter about this competition in the book Step Change, which is published in 2001. At the beginning of the 20th century, just as in England, step dancing was a popular form of dance for the working classes in Australia. It was common for a night's entertainment, particularly at a dance, to include an item of step dancing. In dancing schools, the standard repertoire included a clog horn pipe and waltz, an Irish jig, sailor's horn pipe, highland fling, sword dance and a reel, probably with percussive steps. There is some evidence that a distinctive Australian style may have developed and this is represented in the names of dancers such as the Melbourne Clog Dance and the Sydney Flash. However, most of the dancers came from Britain because a large proportion of the population still regarded the UK as home and wanted to keep the ties to the old country. Just as modern ways began to erode the folk traditions in England, so the popularity of these dancers began to fade in Australia in the 1900s. Here the collecting of folk music did not start until the 1950s 
and it was not until the 60s that Shirley Andrews began to collect dances, and then only social dances. By the time I began to look for the old step dances in the 1980s, there was hardly anyone who remembered them. This video clip shows Paddy Dawson of Tasmania in 2003, the only traditional bush step dancer to be recorded. On the positive side, collectors had been gathering the tunes and stories connected to step dancers. So we do have a selection of these preserved in the National Library and readily available through the Bush Traditions wiki site. Currently in Australia, there is very little step dance outside the modern competitive Irish and Highland dance studios. It is easy to find a class for tap dancing or even Appalachian clogging but there is no awareness that Australia ever had a vibrant culture of step dancing, which was central to folk life. Traces do remain, kept alive by people like Margaret Winnett in Sydney, who teaches and performs old-style traditional step dances. Margaret has in her repertoire an English clog waltz, known as the Milkmaid's Waltz, which was taught in Irish and Scottish dance schools up until the 1970s, but has since disappeared. This is a film clip of Margaret dancing the first two steps. It was traditionally danced in English clogs. stage this clog waltz began to take on a Dutch identity and lost its connection to the English tradition. In summary, from the first days of British settlement, Australia had a lively culture of step dancing brought by the convicts and free settlers. Throughout the 19th century, step dancing in its various forms continued to be a popular and widespread leisure activity. Following the trends in England, Clog dancing became a major form of entertainment. In the 20th century, interest in these dances changed and they largely disappeared as inclusive folk dances. Today, Irish and Highland dancing remains prevalent in Australia, particularly for school aged children. They are danced at a highly competitive level, which tends to emphasise athletic virtuosity and few continue to dance when they reach adulthood. These dances are rarely seen outside the world of competition and are not part of the general folk scene. If we want to re-establish the step dance tradition in Australia as a non-competitive folk art, we will need to follow the Scottish example where they have reintroduced dances which have survived in Cape Breton or draw upon the enthusiasm for revitalising step dances in the south of England. There is an interest in these traditions in the upcoming generation, and it would be a fine thing if we could collaborate with others interested in this field to bring the dances back to our folk culture.